I really know how it feels to know that your life is not worth a penny. I mean, just some drunk fool fires up the cannon and kills you. It started as a dream. If I could keep some of these kids alive, then the culture would remain alive and the ethnic cleansing would not have succeeded. It became a reality. I became overnight a father, an uncle, a grandfather, a immigration officer, a guidance counselor, a therapist. It's one man's answer, an American story. This is ABC News Nightline, reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. It's hard to imagine our story tonight unfolding quite the way it did in any country but this one. Think about it. A Lebanese-American from New Hampshire hears a Romanian-American from New York lecturing the President of the United States on his responsibilities toward the people of Bosnia. The Romanian-American, a Jew, is also a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, which gives him a certain moral clout. The Lebanese-American, a photographer, is a Muslim as are many Bosnians. What the Nobel Peace Prize winner said to the President of the United States may or may not have had a direct influence on what he did, but it moved the photographer toward a course of action that has already forever changed the lives of 72 very bright Bosnian youngsters and an equal number of generous and open-hearted American families who cannot possibly have known what they were getting into. This is a rich, joyous and moving story about the power of words and the capacity of one man to make a difference. It was reported and produced by Catherine Cross. I'm one of four boys, first generation American of Lebanese parents. I was born and raised in New Hampshire. Went to school here, studied architecture, and found out that I was a better photographer than I was an architect. And so I became a photographer. I started working, uh, started getting involved with stories like the Palestinian refugees and the Arab-Israeli wars and conflicts that were sort of rolling through the Middle East one after another. And a lot of the wars and troubles that I covered before had distinct lines. This war was so random and so violent that I wasn't willing to subject myself or my family to that kind of vagary of war. Uh, but it was an issue I cared passionately about. I felt that there was a war raging in Europe that was happening on terms that we thought 50 years ago would never happen again. And then the U.S. government dedicated the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And Elie Wiesel, himself a Holocaust survivor, delivered a speech in which he chastised the president. And Mr. President, I cannot not tell you something. We must do something to stop the bloodshed in that country. And my daughter Iman, who's a Muslim as I am, was watching with me. And she said, Dad, is there going to be a Holocaust museum for the Muslims of Bosnia someday? And to me, that was a signal to act. Three years ago, Robert Ozzie began a one-man campaign. His goal, to bring Bosnia's brightest students to America to complete educations disrupted by war. Is it safe? I felt that if I could keep some of these kids alive, if I could keep them in school and educated, then the culture would remain alive and the ethnic cleansing would not have succeeded. I think you should keep this for a while longer. I became overnight a father, an uncle, a grandfather, a immigration officer, a guidance counselor, a therapist. I mean, I had to be everything to these kids until they settled in and got into some kind of rhythm with their host families who were also new at it. None of us knew what we were doing. Okay, now, constitutionality. Let's discuss it. Alan Kozovic is 17 years old. He grew up in Sarajevo and spent two and a half years in the middle of the war. If you had an interview with me two years ago, that wouldn't be Alan, that would be somebody else. So uh, what, what happened is um, 
changed my life. I've seen what's the point of life. I just grew more faster than I supposed, I guess. I mean, in light of constitutionality, you've seen so many things take place. It's hard for me to say sometimes, like, I've seen that or I've seen this, because most of those kids, they can't even imagine, you know, pieces of body all over the place. They just think that's happening somewhere on the moon, or they have no clue, you know, they, they're just like out of that. When do we say that we have a right to be extra constitutional? Any insights here? No. <laughs> no? Like I told my host family, if they ever gonna have any extra food to save for tomorrow for me, because I, I don't, I just don't want to see it, you know, in the trash, because it, that bothers me a lot, because um, through that two and a half years, all I ate was beans, some cans, bread, and some mixtures of all those, you know, some trash food. Shaking stop. He used to shake all the time. He just, uh, he'd have a tremor in his hands. Found that has stopped. Um, He's it, about 20 pounds heavier. Right, I, I would. yeah. And maybe even 30, I would say. Yeah. Mariana O'Donnell and her husband Scott took Alan in one and a half years ago. It hasn't always been easy. It was difficult for Alan to accept me as um, somebody that's in charge in my own home. And I just think it's just a cultural thing and it took a lot of work in explaining mm. to him that we just do things different here. Uh, no, that's that mine. $22, please. $22? That's not yours, Dad. That's the bank. Let me that it's expensive in terms of time, emotion, yeah. um, things like that. It's yeah, why not? How much? It's 260 bucks. I'm going to lose my mind. 260? Yeah. I mean, we worry about Alan the same as we worry about Sean and Robert. You know, he's, he, he, he's like my son now. I'll give you three hundred for the property. No, 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 no. His goal was to um, learn to fly and to join the military, fly in the military. Now it's not something that he talks about the way he used to. No, it's mostly snowboarding now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I only want kids that intend to go back. I don't want refugees. I don't want kids to come over here and say, this is a wonderful life. I want a green card. I want to change status. I am a poor, persecuted refugee. I want kids to say, I'm a Bosnian. I'm here in America, and I'm going to get what I can from here, and I'll give you what I can from here, but when it's all said and done, I'm going home because I want my country back together again. This is a picture of my father, my sister, and my mom. Um, I want him to be with the people he loves. And when that time comes, we'll deal with it. But it's not going to be easy. This is ABC News Nightline. Exeter is very Yankee. It makes friends slowly, but whenever we needed something, it was there. It may have not been public, and it may have not been um, in a very demonstrative way, but whatever we needed, you know, the kids that came to Exeter were taken care of. Twelve Bosnian students have called Exeter, New Hampshire, home since Robert Ozzie began his program. More are expected. Yes, at least for another year or so. Uh, I think that schools, in anything but the most elementary and basic sense, are to me one of the last things to be rebuilt. They're still going to need trained, serious people to go back. So I'd like to help in parallel to whatever the government can do now. The fire here. Like you hear when the shell is fired and you count like five seconds and uh, after five seconds uh, here you are saved and it passes on. <laughs> and you have like, you just count the numbers, one, two, three, and it falls, then you are dead. <laughs> Adnan Mesilic is a 19-year-old student from Tuzla waiting to come to the United States. Adnan witnessed perhaps one of the most violent acts that the war created 
he was uh, in Tuzla at the time that a Serb shell fell in a cafe uh, that killed 71 young people and wounded over 150. I don't know if you know what shell does, but uh, one of my friends, they, they, uh, my teacher at primary school, his daughter was recognized by her finger and birthmark. She didn't have a head. Adnan and two of his friends helped keep Tuzla linked through computers to the outside world during the war. He used the computer to reach out to people who knew about this program and ask them to contact me. And our communications were through the computer. Send me your records, send me your school documents, send me a biography, tell me what you want to do with your life, what you'll do if you go back to Bosnia. It was like knocking on his doors from Bosnia. <laughs> And uh, two days later comes a message. Uh, he's flying to see if you, uh, to find your family. Two days later, he has a family. And I was intrigued because of the computer, that if a person could be as skilled and as persistent and as talented to keep this network going in the middle of a war, imagine how much better he could do if he had the safety and sanity and skills of peacetime in an education. So I want him over here. I think these kids have been forced to grow up in a terrible way and simply because of the fact that they were Muslim. Simply the fact that their name ended with certain letters or was pronounced in a certain way. There was no rationale. They were never raised to make those kinds of distinctions and yet someone made them a target because of those very distinctions. A memorial for the victims of the Tuzla bombing is located near the site, in the center of town. Um, for this one, I found it like I met some guy that I know him just. Um, he's a cousin of my girlfriend, and um, and uh, she just told me, "Oh, my cousin's friend is dead. His name is Japa Amr, and uh, it really crushed me. He was." one of my real good friends, and uh, I just didn't know that. I just feel like if the peace is imposed, then everything is going to come somehow naturally. We used to live together before, but I wouldn't be able to live together again. What you see on news of Bosnia is not what it used to be like. It used to be much, much more beautiful. And when I, like, when I see like a house that has, that has been destroyed, I'm not seeing a house that has been destroyed. I'm seeing a house, a new house that can be rebuilt there and that can be even more beautiful than it was. Okay. that? Sure. Okay. Yasminka Hazic is a 20-year-old college student who came to America two and a half years ago. During vacation, she lives with Nancy Gilmore and her two daughters. It was an education to me as well that, no, we are not, like, way above the rest of the world. But, um, we have a lot here, a lot to be thankful for, but there are others out there that have just as much as we have um, in education. She, Yatsa, and, and all her friends have just blown away a lot of the other people around here. Her first day at the high school, um, she walks into a senior advanced math class, and they had an exam that day, and she thought, well, I'll take it just for jokes. <laughs> And it probably was a joke. She got a hundred on that. Last summer, Yasminka returned to Bosnia to visit her parents. She brought back a letter. As Yatsa's parents were happy she got a chance to meet you and to spend time with you. You gave her more than we could, and we really share her, though we think that she is impossible to divide. She accepted you and your family as her own, 
but the relationship relationship between us didn't change a bit. We believe that this dirty war will turn well for us on the end, and then we'll have a chance to meet you in person too. The doors of Bosnia are wide open for you, and we want to host you in our home. Right now, I feel kind of like I'm not e at either place. I'm like kind of in between. And the people that are like myself can understand me the best, you know. It's like within the same position. This is true. Uh -huh. New Year's Eve, Boston. Yasminka is joined by four other Bosnian students. We kind of fit in, but not really, because American teenager, they just want to have fun, right? And it's like, I feel as though we've gone through the more things and we kind of have more clue what the life is all about. Near midnight, they gathered to watch fireworks over Boston Harbor. At first, jubilation. <laughs> then, unexpectedly, the mood changes. I don't know, it's, it's nice to look, but it's not really nice to listen to it. It sounds so, like, similar to when it's, like, shelling and stuff. We have a family in New York that has two Bulletin girls, who called after hearing about this project and said, in World War II, an English family took my mother out of Germany. We're Jewish. And if that English family had not taken my mother, I and my brother wouldn't be here. So that's the cycle, and that's the rhythm that I think can be perpetuated of helping rather than of destroying or of killing or looting, pillaging, raping. I feel pretty good. I feel that I've got a family that I didn't have before. Uh, that these nephews and nieces of mine, if you will, uh, are children that I'm going to know the rest of my life. I know that when we go to Bosnia to visit the homes of these children and the families of these children, it will be like visiting aunts and uncles and cousins that we've gotten to know each other through our children. Okay, yeah, that's him and her. Come on, there they are. Hey, how are you? Oh, welcome, how are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Hi, Sonia. Hi. Welcome. I need to be able to say to my mom someday, this is what we did. Do you remember when Layla came? Do you remember when Vedrina came? And look at where they are now. When we come back, I'll talk with Nobel Peace Prize winner, Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel joins us now from Palm Beach, Florida. Elie, you have spent so much of your life focusing the attention of the world on the unhappiness and the the sorrow of others it must give you a moment of great gratification though to see what an impact your words can have and and the enormous influence that the actions of one man can have that is children all my adult life i have been involved with the suffering of children because i have seen other children and what moved me what broke me broke my heart was when I saw the children of Sarajevo. First, the pictures on this program. They have done it twice. And then when I went with David Marish for you to Sarajevo, and we saw, we saw, we saw things that I cannot forget. They are still haunting me. So I imagine there must be more. There should be more. Because how can one not respond to the smile, to the tears, to the sorrow of a child?
And I'd just like to have your thoughts on what war does to young people and how they can be healed as over the years, to a certain extent, you have been healed. Well, I have not been healed. The scars are still there. The memories are still there. And because I don't forget that I try to do what I'm doing, and the same is true of these children. A child of war will always have 